welcome back to 2GB's special tribute to John Pierce. School was not John's greatest love. He constantly had two things on his mind, flying and broadcasting. In fact, he was so obsessed with these pursuits that he ended his formal education at the tender age of 14 to follow his dreams. He left school at 14. He always wanted to be a radio announcer from when he was very tiny. And when he was nine, he definitely made up his mind that's what he was going to do. And he left school after the intermediate and it was no good going back to school. He probably would have never got the leaving because he's probably got two very, very good subjects and not much else. It was just my dream as a little kid to come up and uh, broadcast on this station. Uh, I used to go home as a school kid and throw my homework in the corner and not do it and turn on the radio and say, one day I will speak on that station. It took me a while to get here because the war came along and then I did something in the country and then in Tasmania. But uh, before I came up here in 54 and met up with just about the greatest radio team that's ever been assembled in the world, I would think. I was the junior boy. I was the young announcer late afternoons. After leaving school, John briefly worked at several jobs, an office boy, a salesman, but all the time scanning the position's vacant columns of the papers for radio announcing jobs. They advertised for a junior announcer at Kempsey when he was 14 and a half, and 60 people applied for the job and he got it. And he went up there and he used to run the children's session and he had a little ukulele and he'd play and he'd have all the kids singing and so forth. I well, went from there to a couple of country stations, then went to Hobart, that's where he met Joe. And the two older boys were born down there. And then he came up to 2GB and uh, moved into the house where they're still there in Artham. And, and well, it's very lovely in lots of ways. There's lots and lots of love in that house. I think the funny thing was that the family always expected that he would become a fourth-generation accountant. John's longtime friend and former colleague, Brian Chasling. John went to Shore in Sydney, his Shore grammar, and he, he always said that he was going to go on radio, and he always said it was going to be 2GB. He'd be an announcer on it, and he never wanted to be anything else. So when, it, when he, he got into his into radio, his mother used to tell her friends that he was only doing that until he could get a decent sort of a job. But John's brief radio career was about to be rudely interrupted. Fellow Australians, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of the persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her and that as a result Australia is also at war. When the war broke out, I thought, oh, thank goodness he's too young. But of course he wasn't eventually. And he, but he always wanted to fly twin-engine bombers, and he did that. Uh, when he did his training, he was an instructor for a while. Then he came back here, and he was flying planes up to Port Moresby and back. Brian Chasley. He was in the Air Force during the war. He went to Canada under the Empire Air Training Scheme, and then stayed on as an instructor. And he once told me that he made a great contribution towards the successful outcome of the war on behalf of the Allies, that during his flying career, uh, he crashed three Tiger Moths. He shot up five bison. He shot out two uh, town hall clocks and a little old lady riding a bicycle on a country road and a water tower on the Canadian Pacific Railroad. The war's end allowed John to restart his radio career at 2QN Deniliquin and later at 3SH Swan Hill. While on holidays in Sydney, John applied for a job at 2GB and got one. Only thing was, it was on Hobart radio station 7HO. Hobart, Tasmania was little more than a sleepy country town in 1950. About the only excitement in the village was the recently introduced Sydney to Hobart yacht race. The leading boats would sail up the Derwent a day or two before New Year's Eve and the whole of Hobart seemed to erupt into celebrations. 
Hobart's only other claim to fame was the newly built Rest Point Hotel, sitting proudly on a promontory at Sandy Bay. Rest Point was the welcoming icon for the boats, much as the Opera House is in Sydney Harbour today. Rest Point, 20 years later, was to become Australia's first legal casino, but in 1950 it was the place to be seen in Hobart if you could afford it. Hobart, Slobart, as we expatriates used to call the place. It seemed to us that Tasmania was cut off from the real world by Bass Strait. We used to refer to the mainland in almost a hushed voice. I'd found myself in Hobart when my ambitions for a career in radio hit the wall with a sacking from Radio 2UW in Sydney. Station 7HO offered me a job at £8.10 a week and they put me up in a guest house where I was to share a converted garage with another guest. That other guest was a young radio pretender like myself, a few years older than I, since he had served in the RAAF and was able to entertain us with stories of his exploits overseas. Overseas was a long way in 1950. The tyranny of distance was very real. The young man was John Pierce, who told me he had two ambitions, to fly a plane and talk on the wireless by the time he was 18. And he achieved both. After DMOB, John hit the country radio trail in pursuit of his dream, as most of us did. He'd come to 7HO via 2QN Daniloquin and 3SH Swan Hill. He probably read an ad in the Wireless and Broadcasting Weekly, like most of us did, reading something like announcer required by Capital City Radio Station. Applicants should be familiar with all facets of broadcasting. Salary £8.10 a week. Apply Eric McRae, manager 7HO Hobart. I started dating a beautiful young Queensland girl who'd come south with a sense of adventure in the 1950s. She was working as a receptionist at the old Heathorns Hotel. One day she told me that her fellow receptionist was seeing my workmate come roommate, John Pierce. I knew nothing of this. I soon realised that John Pierce played it pretty close to the chest when it came to his private life and he was to do so later when fame and success came. He wisely kept his family life to himself. Indeed, there'd be many who would never believe that any woman could put up with the bluff, gruff, huff and puff man that was established as the talkback host on air on 2GB, but we'll return to that in a moment. Back to Slobart. I married my receptionist and 12 months later made my escape on the old steamer, the Taruna, across Bass Strait back to the real world, the mainland. And it was to be some years before John Pierce and my paths crossed again. After the break, the road to 2GB. He impressed me to be a man of great radio talent. I thought I'd like to see the day that he came to 2GB back in Sydney. This is a special tribute to John Pierce on 873 2GB. 